Hey everybody, it's David. Today we're going to have a bit of fun and talk about the science behind Star Wars Rogue One, which is released in cinemas this weekend. So the film focuses on the construction of the infamous Death Star, a moon-sized battle station with the power to destroy entire planets. The vast size and power of such a megastructure led me to wonder, could we detect the Death Star around a distant star using our current telescopes? Now to answer this, we have to first get a handle as to some of the numbers for the physical dimensions and energy output of the Emperor's favorite toy. Now if only I knew a physicist who was good at estimating such things. Whoa! David, it's me, Martin. I have the Death Star plans that you've been looking for. Firstly, dimensions. The space station is 120 kilometers in diameter. That's about the distance between New York and Philadelphia. And then the super laser. Well, uh, well, I, I've worked it out as well. Um, the gravitational binding energy of an Earth-like or Alderaan-like planet uh, is 10 to the 32 joules. That's the energy output of the sun across a week. But that's condensed into just three seconds of operational time meaning you'd be looking for something about as luminous as the Beta Centauri system. I hope that helps. David, please find the Death Star. You're my only hope. Whoa, awesome. Thanks, Martin. So with these numbers, let's try to think about how we would actually be able to detect the Death Star. Remarkably, astronomers have already pondered these questions. Astronomers really are trying to look for alien megastructures around other stars as an alternative approach in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence S-E-T-I. And in the Star Wars universe, I mean, the Death Star is not supposed to be hidden. It's a show of force, designed such that... Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. So as wild as it sounds, we actually have ways of detecting Death Stars already. First off, when the Death Star is in orbit of an Earth-like planet like Alderaan, then about half a percent of all the other stars in the galaxy would have the right alignment such that they could see the Death Star pass in front of the parent star of Alderaan. Now remember that's called the transit technique, and we already use it all the time to detect exoplanets and even looking for exomoons. One difference is that the Death Star probably isn't hanging around in orbit of its target for many, many years, like a natural moon would. But nevertheless, it will be seen to be transiting somewhere in the universe at any given time. In fact, each day, about a quarter of a percent of those stars with the right alignment would be witnessing the Death Star transit. So put together, that means there's probably about a million star systems in the galaxy at any one time which can see the Death Star transiting. But the Death Star is much smaller than a planet. Using Martin's estimate of 121 kilometer diameter, and assuming it's passing in front of a sun-like star, that would give us a transit depth of just seven parts per billion. That's way below our sensitivity right now. So transits seem tricky, but what about this ridiculously high-powered laser that the Death Star has? Well, with a power of 10 to the 32 watts, or 100,000 billion 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 watts, Surely the Death Star would light up like a Christmas tree, right? Well, not quite, because that energy is confined to a very narrow beam laser which is being directed at a specific target from a very short range. But when the target planet, in the case of, say, Alderaan, was obliterated, it would lead to a very sharp infrared spike which would actually outshine the star. The planetary debris, assuming it wasn't all vaporized, would hang around in orbit of the star colliding together and grinding down into ever smaller grains. So that would keep the debris field warm for millions of years. This warm debris could be detectable with an infrared telescope, as might be the large impacts between big chunks of rock. In fact, we've actually already achieved that in an alien planetary system. For example, in 2014, Meng and colleagues reported that NGC 2547 experienced an infrared brightening and dimming over two years consistent with collisions between planetary fragments. Now that's actually exactly the kind of signal that an obliterated Alderaan might leave behind. Over millions of years, tides from the parent star would stretch out that debris field into a ring or a belt around the star, just like our own asteroid belt in the solar system. So I'll throw that out there for any of you sci-fi writers. I mean, the asteroid belt in the solar system could be the remnant of a Death Star-like attack a long, long time ago. But all of this is hardly unambiguous evidence for a Death Star. I mean, planetary debris in asteroid belts also happen 
naturally, without any involvement by a grand admiral Muff. Probably the best way to make an unambiguous detection, as unlikely as it seems, would be if the Death Star missed its target. So let's imagine that the rebels snuck on board the Death Star, they couldn't stop the firing sequence, but they could redirect it and cause it to miss Alderaan. Like all laser beams, and indeed all forms of electromagnetic radiation, the beam must widen due to diffraction as it propagates through space. Assuming the laser beam uses green light, has the minimum divergence possible allowed by diffraction, and started out with a beam width of 25 meters, the beam would spread out to a width of about twice the diameter of the sun after traveling 10 light years. So if you were a background planet and lucky enough to get caught in that beam cone, even at 10 light years away, every squared meter of your surface would be baked by six terawatts of power. That's certainly enough to sterilize the surface. If the Death Star beam traveled from one side of our galaxy to the other, by the time it reached the other end, it would have a beam width several times wider than the orbit of Pluto around the Sun. By this point, there's a good chance that the planetary system would have been unlucky enough to land in the beam cone, with each squared meter of its surface receiving at least 60 kilowatts. That's equivalent to some military-grade lasers. But not to worry, because George Lucas told us that this was a galaxy far, far away. By the time the Death Star laser had made the two and a half million year journey, from the Milky Way to our nearest galaxy, Andromeda, the power per meter squared in that laser would now be 90 watts. So that's not gonna kill you, but you would actually still feel it on your skin as warm. Quite frankly, when you're talking about a 10 to the 32 watt laser, that would likely be detectable from the other side of the universe as long as you were in that beam cone. So I'd say that if the Death Star missed its target, we happened to land in the beam cone and we weren't in the same galaxy as the Death Star, then yes, we could detect it without it killing us. Here at the Cool Words Lab, we actually came up with a way to signal and even cloak our presence using a much lower powered laser system of order of tens of megawatts. That's actually something we could build today. To learn more, you can click here for Alex's video on that. We really do think that lasers could be a very effective way to communicate across the stars, thanks to those very narrow beams they have. So thank you so much for watching this video, everybody, and big thank you to Martin for helping me out with this one. Make sure you go over and check out his videos as well. If you like this and wanna get more videos from the Cool Words Lab, then do make sure, if you haven't already, you click the subscribe button below. It really does help us out. So I hope you all enjoy the new Star Wars film this weekend. I'm pretty sure I will. And until next time, stay thoughtful and stay curious. Hey everyone, Martin here. Great video by the way, David. If you want to know more about the Death Star, in particular how we might be able to build it and get around the power and artificial gravity problems, head on over to my channel, Martin Archer, where I'll be talking about whether the Death Star could actually be a star.